Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Hayes. I'm president of CBA, Custom Benefit Administrators, in Roseville, California. We are the administrator for the district for the Flexible Benefit Plan and COBRA, and uh, we work very closely with Epic, the brokers, and Denise in the benefits department. And I'm here today to talk to you about the HSA accounts that are being introduced to the district uh, effective July 1. So this whole meeting is going to be about really covering and drilling down in the details of the HSA account, how it works, what the rules are, what the restrictions are, um, and uh, also how it integrates a little bit with the high deductible health plan, the health plan option you have to choose in order to be eligible to have one of these accounts called an HSA. So um, the plan starts on July 1, 2014. And uh, so first what I want to do is just go over roughly the high deductible health plan. So again, when in order to have an HSA, you must be enrolled in a plan, a medical plan that qualifies as a high deductible health plan. And that's just a category of health plan that essentially set by the government, certain parameters are required, certain deductibles, certain co-payment maximums and things like that. So the district has chosen a plan from Western Health uh, that called the 1800 plan and it's a very simple plan actually it essentially says that you are responsible for if you have single coverage or individual coverage you are responsible for the first eighteen hundred dollars of expenses in the calendar year and uh, and if you have family coverage you are responsible for up to thirty six hundred dollars of expenses in the calendar year and there's no per person deductible on the on a family coverage so if you have family coverage a single person could incur the whole $3,600. Does everyone understand that? And then after that, um, you know, you'll have, you have more detailed uh, summaries in your materials, but after that, I believe the plan pretty much picks up every expense. So really, even though it looks like a lot to some of you that are not used to a plan like this, uh, most other plans have co-payments and co-insurance and things like that. They kind of nickel and dime you to death on expenses. My health plan has a $40 office visit copay every time I go to the doctor. So even though this is structured a little bit differently, it's, there's a lot of plans, even co-payment plans, you can end up spending $1,800 or more or $3,600 or more out of pocket. So it's a great plan. So we want to make sure that you understand the deductible. The way health plans in this country work almost exclusively is that deductibles operate on a calendar year basis. Your benefits, your medical plan, however, renews on July 1. So you have to remember going into this plan, we want to make sure it's very clear to you that you're going to start a deductible on July 1 and then that deductible will start over again on January 1 of next year, 2015. Then you'll have the full 12 months to deal with. But this first six month period, there's no way around it. Whenever you switch plans, you have this exposure. So does everybody understand that? Okay. And so just to give you an example, uh, if you in, go into the hospital, you incur an expense for $1,800 as, if you're on the individual plan, you pay that $1,800 in December, and then you have to go back to the hospital in January, you'd be liable for a new $1,800 in January. The good news is you wouldn't have any other exposure until January of 2016. Can you believe we're talking about 2016? Okay. Okay, so the other thing that's great about what the district is doing, and this really is a fabulous benefit, and that is for many of the employees, uh, you are eligible for an employer contribution. And that employer contribution depending, depends on a couple things. Number one, it depends on which bargaining groups you're in. Uh, it also depends on whether you have individual coverage or family coverage. There is no plus one, plus two, plus spouse, plus child in, in the HSA world. It's just individual coverage or you plus any dependent is family. Okay? So if you have individual coverage, your, your employer contribution can be $100 per month, right? And if you have employee plus one or family coverage, your employer contribution could be $150, is $150 a month. If you are a part-time employee but you still qualify for a contribution, then you'll get a, a pro rata portion of that employer contribution. Make sense? And you can see there that the LRCEA is still in negotiations, so we don't know what that, uh, if any contribution will be made by the employer for that group. All right? Any questions on that? 
That's a great benefit. Now, when we get into the maximums you can contribute, you have to deduct this amount from the maximum you can contribute. So the maximum includes the employer contribution, okay? Okay, so we also want to make sure, because there's always rules and regulations with all these things, right? The government runs these, these programs or has produces a lot of regulations that control these programs. So you can have dual coverage here at the district. I mean, you, you all probably know that if you have a spouse working here at the district, you can have dual coverage. So the district wants to make sure everybody is very clear if you, if you both cover each other, if you both have family coverage, you choose the high deductible health plan and you both get coverage and you both get family coverage, then you'll have true dual coverage and, but I believe you will only be responsible for one deductible because it's a fully integrated deductible. Okay, so those of you, does anyone have the spouse that works here and might have double coverage? Okay, but we're being, we're being taped, so we want to make sure we cover this point. Um, so you only have one exposure. You don't have two deductibles to deal with if you have that, okay? In addition, you can both, if you both qualify to have an HSA, you could each open an HSA and you could each get the employer contribution if you otherwise qualified to get the employer contribution. Does that make sense? Now, if you have family coverage for both you, double coverage for you and your spouse, and you only want to have one HSA, which is the bank account, the savings vehicle, then you're only going to get one employer contribution. So in this instance, the employer contribution is driven by the fact that you're A, eligible to have each have an HSA here at work, and B, you open up two HSA accounts, which is just, you means you have to manage two HSA accounts as opposed to one. It's not a big hassle. And the district pays the administration fee for the HSA account as long as you are an eligible employee. Okay? So there are a couple other points here. Both employees will be eligible for the district contribution to the HSA. It also says keep in mind that expenses for domestic partners do not qualify for reimbursement of HSA funds. So this is a very convoluted part of our society right now, the whole domestic partner issue. We've all probably heard about DOMA and the Supreme Court's decision about same-sex marriages and things like that. So the way it works is if you are a same-sex married couple, that is your spouse. And it counts, you just think of it like any spouse, right? It'd be no different than any traditional uh, 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 husband and wife's uh, family situation. You both qualify under the benefits for the same way. You both qualify for the HSA the same way. You both qualify for the employer contribution the same way. However, under federal law, and these HSA accounts themselves function under federal law, there still is no uh, a regulatory ex um, uh, definition or acceptance of domestic partners as a spouse. So in the state of California, you can cover a, a domestic partner, but you can't, you can't reimburse your domestic partner's expenses through an, a health savings account. Okay? So it gets a little confusing there. We'll touch on that a little bit more later on. Okay, real quick about CBA. Uh, we're a family-owned business. We have 20 employees, soon to be 21 employees. We're all located in Roseville. We're all together, Roseville, California. We're all together. And I guess that's a picture of me like 30 years ago. I have no idea. Now, there's a lot of paperwork in our business, right? So we have about 800 employers that are, are, are clients of ours. Uh, we primarily deal with employers that are domiciled in Northern California. About 80 to 90 percent of our clients are in Northern California. Uh, and we only work with a select group of brokers uh, in, throughout the state of California, Nevada. We don't work with all brokers and it's just because we choose to work with the best. Okay? And also, I want to make sure you our acronyms here. HSA is Health Savings Account. We are not the bank for the health savings account. We are the servicing agency for the health savings account. The bank's behind the scenes. Okay, so what is an HSA account? So again, we have to, there's two parts to this conversation that everybody has to keep clear in their heads. And one is, I've got the high deductible health plan, that's my medical plan, completely separate. I am not required to open an HSA if I have a high deductible health plan. I, I don't have to ever make a contribution to an HSA, it's just, Having, being enrolled in the high deductible health plan gives me the right to have one of these special accounts called a health savings account. And they are very special. Under the, under the, the tax laws, they have benefits that virtually nothing else has. 
So the first thing is, is that uh, all the money you put into an HSA, and this includes an employer contribution, is 100% federal income tax free. If you happen to be contributing to Social Security, you also don't have to pay Social Security tax. If you happen to be paying into Medicare, you also don't pay any Medicare tax on your contribution to an HSA. Okay, now the state of California, unfortunately, is one of, I think, two or three states, two or three states, might be only two anymore, that do not align with federal tax rules on HSA contributions. So you do have to pay California state income tax on your HSA contributions and on the growth you'll earn in your HSA. So they treat it just like you had a CD down at the bank. Yes, push your button. I remember. There you go. What happens if you move to another state? Well, then if you earn income in that state, you'd fall under the rules of that, the income, and you're making contri new contributions, then you would fall, and you'd be domiciled in that state, and you would fall under the tax rules of that state. Again, we're trying to get California to fall in line, but, you know, there's, it's, you know, they're starting to talk about budget surpluses. Have you heard about that? Budget surplus. We haven't heard about that in years. So maybe they'll get a little bit more... Uh, They'll, maybe they'll soften their stance a little bit here, in the, you know, in the next few years. But so far, we've heard nothing about California uh, giving any relief on that issue. But anyway, federal taxes is by far the biggest chunk. You have a question? Yeah. Is there a um, uh, interest involved in this? Yes, there is. I'll get to that in a second. There's actually there's actually great investment options. So. Um, so there's no federal income tax on the contributions you make, your contributions or the employer contributions. There's no federal income tax on your growth. And as long as you use the money to reimburse yourself to pay for eligible or legal medical care, doesn't even, it doesn't matter if it's covered under your medical plan or not. It could be dental benefits, could be, a, could be glasses, could be orthodontics for your child, whether your child's covered here at work with you or not. It doesn't matter. Once the money's into the account, as long as you use the money for a legal medical expense, it's completely tax-free coming out of the account. It's really the only thing you and I have available as a vehicle that's utterly tax-free going in, not even any Social Security tax, utterly tax-free while growing, and utterly tax-free when we take it out. Now, there are some rules, which we'll touch on here, but that's really what makes HSA, HSA accounts so powerful. Okay, who's eligible to contribute? We've already covered that you have to be enrolled in a high deductible health plan but there's then there's a few buts right so here's here's one you'll love this is typical government language right you may not you may not you, you may not be covered under a non high deductible health plan so what does that mean let's say you enroll in the high deductible health plan here at the district but your spouse works for the state of california and your spouse covers you under his or her hmo plan through the state of California. So you're covered here under the high deductible health plan and through your spouse through their work, okay? That's not a high deductible health plan and therefore, because you're covered under your spouse's plan, you may not make a contribution to an HSA. You are not eligible. Now, I don't know why anybody would want to be double covered if they're choosing the HDHP, but, but, uh, but well, I guess I could understand it, but just you have to understand that rule, okay? You may not have coverage under a full medical FSA. The district offers a health FSA, a flexible spending account. You may not participate in that flexible spending account and at the same time make contributions. So is anybody in the health FSA right now? Okay, if you are, then you're not eligible to start making contributions to the HSA until January. It's a federal rule. It has nothing to do with the district or us or CBA or anything. Okay? So you have to just wait to open your HSA until January 1. You may not be enrolled in Medicare, and that includes Medicare Part A. So it's not just the Medicare that we pay for, it's also the free Medicare. Yes? So retirees that are over 65 cannot withdraw from their, yeah. Go oh, ahead. About the, from the, you were saying about how you can withdraw for legal medical expenses. Great question. Okay, so this is where it all gets a little, you have, you have to keep these pieces kind of separate and it becomes very, at first it's kind of like being talked to about how to ride a bike, right? It sounds very convoluted. It's not that hard. We're talking about contributions. So once you're enrolled in Medicare, you can't make new money contributions. Until you're enrolled, 
you can make contributions. And even when you're in Medicare, there's nothing that restricts you from accessing the money. Okay, so thank you for asking that. It's a great question. And you may not be claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return. You have to file your own tax return. Okay, so the maximum contributions we can make for 2014, and you always have to think of HSA contributions as monthly maximum. That's the way the, the law is kind of set up. So it's basically, are you eligible to make a contribution on July 1? You may be if you enroll in the HDHP. You would not be in because he's got a medical FSA. So it, as of July, you could not make a contribution, but you could. So what is the most you can contribute? Well, if you have single coverage in 2014, the most you can contribute per month is $275. Remember that includes the employer contribution. So if you're getting $100, the most you can put in is $175. Make sense? Remember, the district, if the district is giving you $100, that comes off the $275 maximum. If you have family coverage, the most you can put in is $545.83 per month. And again, remember, if you qualify for that $150 contribution, that comes off that amount. I can't do the math right now, but it sounds to me like $395, something like that, per month that you would be able to put in. Okay, and then if you're lucky enough to be over 55, as I am, you get a bonus amount. So you can put in, the government says you can put in an extra $1,000 because you got started so late, we want you to be able to put in a little bit more money, accelerate it. Because the idea behind HSAs really is, has germinated from the concept that we're running out of money to pay, cover our, our, us, our medical expenses as senior citizens. The, the country is running out of money. And so they really are trying to encourage people to basically self-insure, to, to build up assets so we can afford decent medical care when we become senior citizens. Can I yes? Actually, the answer is yes, you could, but um, uh, where did you get the 1800 bucks? <laughs> okay, so... So if you, could you just put in the money, the 1800 The answer is yes, you could. But you can't do it through, you can't really do it through payroll. But you could do it on your own and then take a deduction on your taxes. I'll get into that in a second. You can put money in that way. So, um, okay. Now next year it goes up a little bit because it's indexed. So you'll see as of January 1 of 2015, the amount you and I can put into these accounts just goes up incrementally. All right? Okay, and those are monthly contributions. So if you are not paid 12 times a year, let's say you were, like in a lot of school districts have a 10 pay and a nine pay schedule. Remember, those amounts are calendar monthly amounts. So you kind of have to, you could put in obviously more than that if you have less than 12 pay periods. Does that make sense? I don't think you have anybody that does, but do you? Okay, all right, well then that's a good point. Okay, the full contribution rule. So now you sign up for your HSA on July 1 of 2014. You're exposed to the full deductible. Let's say you want to use the HSA as a long-term savings vehicle, which is a great idea if you can afford it, okay? And you want to put in the maximum amount that you're allowed by law for 2014 into your HSA account. You can do that. It's called the full contribution rule. And basically what it says is, as long as you open your HSA by December 1st of 2014, or December 1st of any year, you are allowed to make a full contribution for that entire year, even though there's a monthly maximum. So you can put in that whole $33.50 in there, in there for 2014. The only thing you have to remember if you put in a full calendar year contribution in your first year of enrollment is that if you drop out of the HSA in the next year, you're going to get penalized. So let me see if I can restate that, because if you understand that the first time through, you're a genius. Okay? I didn't, for sure. So basically remember that the HSA contributions are monthly maximums. You come on, start on July 1, 275. Remember we talked about 275 is your maximum you can put in. If you just stick with 275 every month for the rest of this year, you're golden. But let's say you say, well, wait a second, I want to put in that whole 3,350 bucks for 2014. I'm trying to build up assets in this thing, right? And a lot of people want to do that. You're allowed to. You're allowed to, but the government says you have to, if you do that, you have to keep your HS, your high deductible health plan, you have to stay eligible 
for the high deductible health plan through the entire next calendar year. So that means that if you make that decision, you are going to get penalized if you say next July 1, I'm done with the HSA, I want to get back to the Kaiser HMO plan. Okay? So you're going to get penalized because the government basically is going to say, uh, 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 you're going to be put in too much money in 2014. Does that make sense? It's just something to remember if you want to max fund your 2014 election. Okay. Yes. Does this only apply that first year? Yes. Okay. That full contribution rule is only going to matter the very first year you're really in the plan. It could, it, well, it could matter the last year if you pre-fund your whole annual election and then you drop out midway through the year because you would have only been allowed to put in six months worth of contributions. Does that make sense? But the full contribution rule really is designed for the first year enrollee. It's really designed for the person who comes on because the government understands that deductibles and stuff are calendar year deductibles. So the government's basically said, look, if you come on December 1, you're still exposed to your entire deductible for that one month period. So let's let people fully fund their HSA. But they basically said, if we're going to give you this tax break, you got to at least stay on the HSA for the full next calendar year. It's not that unfair. It's just hard to explain. And most people love this once they get into it. So they don't want to, they don't even think about getting out. Um, okay, I, but I need to make clear sure. what it is about the, the district contribution, because we can't put in 3300 We have to put 3300 minus... 1200 or yeah, 1800 Yeah, yeah. Right, right, exactly. So you don't really mean 3300 you Well, mean I mean 30... When I'm talking 3300 and that's a great point, I'm always talking the maximum, the aggregate maximum. So yes, you always have to back off the amount that the district is putting in on a monthly basis, because they're going to put that in every month. So if you, let's just say you choose single coverage and you're under 55 and you've got 3350 for this year, the district's going to put in between July 1 and December 31, they're going to put in $600, right? So you could fund the difference between 3350 and $600, whatever that is, 2750. Is that right? 2750? Uh, 2750, I think I still do math. Uh, 2750. You could put that all in between July 1 and December 31 of this year. And that means you would end up the 2014 year with $3,350 in that account. So if you want to use the uh, payroll deduction part, you, that's, that's your other option. Instead of pre-funding or lump sum funding, you can have them take it out of your monthly checks. Yes, and you checks. could, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, and I mean, unless Denise has a, 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 a the, the, unless the district has a rule about this, if you wanted to, let's just say, let's use that same example. I have, tw I have I'm allowed to put in 2750 for the rest of this year. I want to put it all in over six months. I'm going to get six paychecks. You divide 2650 by, 2650 by, by six paychecks, and you put an equal amount in, and you sign up for that amount to come out of your paycheck whatever that amount is, three, $400 a month. Does that make sense? And you could do it through payroll. Or you could say, you know what, I'm just gonna put in the 175 a month through payroll. And then if I have the extra money in my bank account at home by the end of the year, and I wanna decide at that time at the end of December to fully fund my 2014 HSA, you have you can go right on the website and transfer money from your personal bank account right into your HSA account. So you can put money in two ways. You can put money in through payroll and you can put money in through a personal transfer right from your bank account. So you, you people play it all different ways and we can talk about that individually and whatnot if, if, if you're still confused about that. But basically you just want to think in terms of there's a monthly maximum as long as I'm eligible Every month for the whole year, then I can, and I'm allowed to put in that full annual maximum, and I can pretty much do it any time. Now, the district's going to want you to pretty much choose an amount you want through payroll and keep it the same. I, you're allowed to change your contribution, but, I, but if you came in every month, I think Denise and her staff would probably go, hey, look, you know, you know what I mean? This is, this is too much burden on, on us, so get, pick, pick a number and love it. Stick with it. But, but there's no rule against it. That's just... That's just, you know, too much work for, you're just putting too much work on the, on the staff. But you can put in money, again, you can put in money through payroll. You can change that payroll deduction on a prospective basis during the year. And you can also transfer money anytime you want over from a personal account. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. 
Okay, so what types of expenses can you use the money that's in an HSA for? Well, it's any out-of-pocket, it's basically any out-of-pocket medical expense that you incur. And we're not talking about a medical expense covered under your medical plan. We're talking about a medical expense under the Internal Revenue Code. It is hugely much more uh, broad than your medical plan itself, right? Because under the code, acupuncture, chiropractic, dental expenses, vision expenses, uh, you know, uh, a lot of other expenses are covered are medical expenses. There's even things you and I can buy at the store over the counter, like bandages and stuff, that we can pay for with tax-free dollars out of our HSA account, if we so choose. So what you can use it for is, is um, anything that qualifies as a medical expense. And if there's, we have examples in the material to kind of get you started. There's tons of information on the internet. Uh, we also are, are uh, we'll be adding a, very shortly, we'll be adding a, a, a feature on our website called FSA Store where you can actually go online and look at all the over-the-counter type stuff you can buy tax-free. Um, and um, there's a lot of other resources for that. But basically, uh, it's obviously it applies to anything, expenses that apply to your health, dental, or vision deductibles or co-payments or co-insurance. So certainly anything that's covered in your medical dental vision plan that you pay for a deductible, a co-payment, a co-insurance, is all reimbursable out of your HSA. You're, we already covered dental services and vision and services, uh, prescription drugs and medicines, uh, alternative health, we've talked about that a little bit, and over-the-counter. And what's also great about over-the-counter is the debit card you are going to get with the HSA is when you swipe it at a retail store or at a pharmacy, it knows it will only pay for things that you're allowed to pay for with it. It won't even let you buy, you can't buy beer with it, okay? Now you can take money out of your account for any reason because it's your money, but the card limits you to keep you from making a, a silly decision. Or, I don't know if buying beer is a silly decision, but you know, for this purpose, okay? So, um, when you go to a store and buy things, now again, you're going to use your card, so you don't even have to really understand this, but the government has very convoluted rules on what you and I can purchase at a store and not pay taxes on. Okay? What they, uh, and the first thing is, is, is uh, you, you, you can be reimbursed out of your HSA. You can take money out of your HSA to reimburse yourself or pay for drugs, over-the-counter drugs and medicines, but only if you get a prescription for those over-the-counter drugs and medicines. So isn't that weird? Because the definition of over-the-counter means you don't need a prescription, but then you have to go to your doctor and ask for a prescription for Excedrin. And believe me, your doctor will know exactly what you're asking for because they'll be ticked and they're bothered by this, and this is a, a rule that they think is the silliest thing in the world, that they have to spend their valuable time giving prescriptions for things like Excedrin and Aspirin and Bayer if you want to be reimbursed for it. So be careful when you go to your doctor and ask for it. You might not get the response you want. But there's still thousands and thousands of items you and I can buy that are not medicines, but they're over-the-counter items that we can buy and pay for through our HSA. Tax-free. Use tax-free money to pay for. Bandages and things like that. Basically, anything that's made in a factory that's a medical supply is reimbursable. Anything that's made in a laboratory that's a drug or a medicine, you have to get a prescription for. Okay? Now, again, we're only talking about over-the-counter items here. We're only talking about things you buy at a store and... Um, again, the card is going to take care of you. It's going to protect you. So uh, you don't even have to. When you go to Safeway, you buy 100 items, you swipe your card. If you want to use your HSA account, it'll pay for as much as it can out of your HSA, and then the cashier, the cashier will ask you for another form of payment for the rest of your purchase. Okay? Very easy. Okay. So I, we, we, I don't want to spend any time on this, but, but the, here's a, a list of items that... Um, that you, might, uh, that you might consider, or some people, and some people do consider these medical expenses. By the way, all these expenses have been submitted to us as an administrator as medical expenses. So people have actually uh, submitted um, uh, deodorant and food and uh, hair removal and mattresses and toilet paper and vacations. And we get jacuzzis all the time and uh, whatnot. But one of these items really is reimbursable. What is it? Reading glasses. That's, I, don't, I'm, I must give that away or we've just missed mark. Reading glasses. So reading glasses is one of the things you and I can go to at the store and purchase readers, you know, without a prescription and still use our HSA to pay for it if we so choose. 
Okay, no nos. Uh, you cannot use tax free HSA money to pay for cosmetic services. So, in dentistry, what's cosmetic? Whitening. Te teeth whitening, right? Teeth whitening is cosmetic. You can't use tax, the government says you can't get a tax break on stuff that's cosmetic. Braces. Okay, braces is a great question. So, the question is, is are braces cosmetic? Let's say for adults, if I, if I was to get one, is it cosmetic? Ah, well, you and I as, as, as common sense people would say it depends, but the code never says it depends because if an orthodontist puts braces on your mouth, they're saying you don't have a perfect bite. You have a terrible affliction called malocclusion, which means you have an imperfect bite. And that means you need braces. And therefore, it's never purely cosmetic, even though you and I might think it is. Okay? Now, that's unless the doctor actually says you have perfect teeth and you don't need braces, which no orthodontist will ever tell you. Okay? And I am being taped. I probably shouldn't have said that. All right. So, health insurance premiums. Uh, you can't be reimbursed for health insurance premiums unless they are COBRA long-term care, while you're, premiums while you're receiving unemployment compensation, so... Uh, and, and, and Medicare premiums, certain Medicare premiums. So, so you can use your HSA to perf pay for some premiums, but generally speaking, if you're just going out and buying your own policy for some reason, you can't use your HSA money to pay for that. And of course, non-medical expenses, okay? So before age 65, before age 65, if you use your HSA to pay for something or you just choose to reimburse yourself for non-medical expenses, you're going to get taxed at the federal level plus a 20% penalty. Once you turn 65, even if you pull the money out for no reason, you just pull it out to take a vacation, you have no medical expenses, there's no more penalty. So it's just like a pension plan in that respect. It's going to penalize you. The idea is long-term savings. What the government's trying to get you to do is set money aside for the long term. So if you pull money out just to take a vacation when you're 40, they're going to say, oh, okay, fine. But you're going to get taxed plus a penalty. Okay? But remember, we all have medical care. We all have medical expenses for us and our families. It's inevitable. All right? And the other thing to remember about this is, and, and this is a, a, you know, I almost hesitate to bring this up because it gets confusing, but once you open your HSA, any medical expense you incur is eligible for reimbursement. That makes sense? But you are not required to use your HSA to pay for that expense at the given time. You could accumulate your expenses for 10 years, stick them in a shoebox, and then reimburse yourself one big huge lump sum uh, amount when you retire and buy your RV and take your trip. So if you're in the FSA now and you incur expenses in December and can make your first payments into the account in January of 2015, can you use HSA funds to pay for the previous month's expenses? Great question. The answer is no. You can only use your HSA to pay for expenses that were incurred, services rendered, from the date you were eligible to open your HSA, from the date you actually opened your HSA. So you'd have, But you could use your FSA for those expenses, assuming you had the money. How do I put money in? Well, we, remember you've got the employer contribution, which is monthly, that is going to go in monthly. You've got your payroll deduction, and when that comes out of your paycheck, the district will not take out any federal income tax or Social Security tax or Medicare tax if you have that. You can also, as we've already discussed, transfer money in. You'll have access to the web portal, you'll, and you'll, you'll be able to just ACH money from your personal account into your HSA whenever you please. If you transfer money from a personal account into your HSA, remember, A, it counts towards your annual maximum, okay? And B, because it's not coming out of your payroll, you're not gonna get a tax break right then because you're taking it out of your personal bank account. But you will get an above the line deduction on that money when you file your taxes. So you get a great deduction on that money, okay? So payroll's the best, but transferring in from a personal account is also a very powerful way to take, make sure you get a good tax break. Okay, who can I pay for with my HSA? We've kind of already discussed this. This is a hard concept again, but once you get it, it's awesome. Number one, if you have single coverage here at work, but you have a spouse and children, once the money's in your HSA, you can use it for your spouse and your children's expenses. So, 
I can have single coverage here at the district. I can put $3,350 away in 2014. I have no medical expenses, but I'm buying braces for my son who's covered under my wife at the state of California, right? But we, have, we incur an expense for braces next year. I can use my HSA to pay for my son's braces. Even though there's no correlation between my son's braces and my high deductible health plan here at the district. Does that make sense? So just remember that most of the restrictions we talk about in an HSA is about putting money into it. Once it's in, it's very liberal the way you can use it. And of course, your spouse, your dependent children, as long as a federal tax dependent. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but you can cover your adult children up to age 26 now under your medical plan. But unfortunately, at the federal level, they did not change that dependent rule for HSAs. So the HSAs still fall under the old rules, which means uh, once they turn 19, unless they're in college, a full-time student, and then it's what, 23 or 24? I think it's 23 or 24. So they have to be a full-time student in college, and they have to be your dependent. And then you can use your HSA money and, and pay for those, their expenses tax-free. Okay? We're trying to get that changed as well. Okay, can I get money, out? how do I get money out of my HSA? Well, the, our HSA, the one that's being sponsored by the district, first of all, has no minimum balance. Most, H, most accounts have a minimum balance of 25 or 50 or $100. Ours has zero. You can take it right down to zero. So whatever you've got in your HSA is available to you at any time. Okay, you can use it to pay for uh, expenses as you incur them. Remember, you already mentioned you're, you're going to get a debit card that's going to access your account directly. Or uh, you can accumulate expenses for future tax-free withdrawal like we talked about just a second ago. You can ac accumulate them and, and treat yourself. We have people that use it as a Christmas club. They save up their receipts during the year, and then they, and then they just keep those receipts. You don't even have to send, give them to us. You just have to keep them. They add all up their, their expenses for the year, $1,896.43 in medical expenses. They go online. They take a distribution for, 18, for that amount of money to put it in their personal bank account and go pay for Christmas. Happens all the time. Yes? Given that example, who, who is approving the disbursement of funds? You are. You would just be subject to an audit if you were not? Sure, like okay. any deduction you and I take. You need to have receipts. You need to keep your records, just like you do. And we have a, um, a we have a, 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 I'm drawing a blank on it, a repository for uh, you to save your receipts online if you so choose, if you want to keep them on the website. So I'm, uh, but now a lot of people choose to still you choose the 9 by 12 envelope, manila envelope, or shoebox way to do it. Just remember, and I'm sure you all know this, but just remember that as soon as you walk out of the store with that thermal paper receipt uh, and wave it and say, whoa, I'm going to get a tax break, in about a week, that ink is going to be gone. So if you want to save it for future use, make a copy of it before you stick it in your shoebox. Because 20 years from now, that'll be gone. Okay? Okay, how do I get money out? Well, you've got the debit card. You've got, a, you can go online and make an online distribution and just say, you know, put this much money into my personal bank account. It's all going to be hooked up. And you can also, if you want, you can say, hey, I want CBA to send a check to a doctor or a hospital or something like that. Boom. Now, the only fee we're going to charge you is if you ask us to send a check to someone. But remember, you've got your debit card. You don't need us to send you a check to someone. You can usually pay. It's a visa system. You can usually pay using your debit card. So you don't have to do it. But if you ask us to mail a check, because of the cost of mailing a check, we'll ding your account for $2.50. It's the only charge we're really going to assess against you. OK? If you submit a claim online, we reimburse every Wednesday and Friday. So whenever you submit the claim, whenever you basically say, pay me, it'll be direct deposited into your bank account, personal bank account. Uh, it'll be sent to your personal bank account on Wednesday or Friday. We also have a great mobile app that you can sign up for. You can do all count lookup and everything. Um, and uh, you can also set yourself up for text messaging. So anytime we distribute money to you or, to, you, know, or, or you have a card transaction, you can set it up so you get reminded on a uh, text message. And that's just in case, this is really for you ladies that are going to give a debit card to your husbands. Uh, this is so you can know that somebody's using the card, right? Okay, any questions on how do I get money out of the account? And again, once you go on the web portal, if you haven't ever used our web portal before, you'll see it's very easy. Okay, there's a picture of your debit card. 
Now, how is my money invested? So the way our HSA works is that, first of all, you earn interest from dollar one. However, today's interest is next to zero. I think we're paying 10 basis points on the cash account, which is as good as anybody, which is nothing, right? But hopefully interest rates will go up a little bit uh, in the future on your savings and you'll be able to get a real interest return. But as of right now, you get interest paid from dollar one in your account. Before you can start investing money, you have to have at least $2,000 in your cash account. So you have to keep at least $2,000 in your cash account, and you can choose to keep any amount you want in your cash account. But the minimum you have to have in your cash account before you can start investing is $2,000. Once you have $2,000 in your account or more, you can then, and you will go and, and you will go set this up on the website. You'll say, as soon as I hit 2000 I want anything over 2000 to be automatically moved to my investment accounts. So once you set it up, you don't have to do anything. And you can go in and say, hey, I want to change that to now have 4000 in my cash account. And it'll move money from your investment account over to your cash account. Or I have, you, you, let's say you're keeping uh, 6000 in your cash account because you want to pay for a big expense of TMJ or something and, with your debit card. And so you've kept your cash account up to six or $8,000. You pay that expense. And then you say, okay, that's my last big expense that I anticipate. I'm going to lower my cash account to two grand, and I'm going to start having anything over two grand move into my investment accounts. The, um, and I'll show you the investment account, a little picture of the investment accounts real quick. Um, there's no loads, there's no transaction fees, there's no annual fees for the investment. Now, mutual funds charge internal fees. You know that. So we have some mutual funds with very low fees. We have Vanguard funds in our portfolio that you can use. So they have extremely low management fees. But when we say no loads, no fees, this is no loads or no fees charged by CBA. Okay? So when you go onto the investment portal, you get onto your own little private web portal account, and you can, you can, um, you, you can see over there on the right, I can't, without my glasses, I can't see. So what's it say? Make an investment? What does it say? Man. Oh. Manage investment transfers, excuse me, thank you. So manage investment transfers. So this is where you can go in and as a fully functioning investment portal, there's about 20 uh, mutual funds of all different risks. There's nothing crazy in there, but all different risks that's managed by our custodian bank. Uh, and uh, try to cover all the, you know, basically all the different risk categories in, in investing. And you can invest in any way you want within those. You can split up the money any way you want. You can do rebalancing and automatic rebalancing and all that good stuff. So for those of you that are sophistic more sophisticated investors, uh, you can really, you've got prospectuses here, you've got FAQs, everything's available on this site to manage these accounts. And of course, these accounts are all very well, well known mutual funds. You can go on Morningstar or any other site and do all your due diligence and research on the, on the various mutual funds. Okay, so when you put money into an HSA account, is the money yours? Is it yours? When the district puts money into your HSA account, is the money yours? Yeah, absolutely. Okay? Hey, we got it right. Okay. Is your HSA portable? If you leave the district, do you leave with your money? Do you leave with your HSA? Absolutely. All right, and how often can you change your election? All right. So you could change your election every month, and again, you might hear from Denise, if you do, which would only be fair, as nice as she is, you'll never, you'll never, but, 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 but generally, but the law does not prevent you from making any changes. The only thing to remember is changes are always prospective. They're always forward. You cannot come in and say, I want to change it, you know, at the beginning of last month. If that even makes sense. Okay? When you want to make a change, you fill out a form, you turn it into benefits, and you, uh, and they will initiate the change. They will give the form to us, change it in payroll, and then send the form to us, and we'll change it in your account. Okay? Okay. Can you use your HSA funds if you are no longer eligible to make contributions? Yes. Absolutely. So remember, whenever we were talking about are, am I eligible, I was always ta we're always talking about am I eligible to make a contribution this month? Am I eligible? Do I have a high deductible health plan? 
Am I eligible to make put money into an HDHP? Now remember, if you leave the district and go into business for yourself and you decide to get an HDHP, they're available on the marketplace, they're available through companies. If you decide to get an HDHP, you can have an HSA qualified individual plan. So an HDHP is being offered through the district, but this may not be the last time you see an HDHP in your life. In fact, they're becoming more and more common. Okay, real quickly, who is the HSA bank, the actual custodian? We want to make sure that there's full disclosure here that you know who the bank is. It's Bell State Bank and Trust out of Fargo, North Dakota, chartered in 1966. It's the largest privately owned bank in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. That may not impress some of you, but it's, it's quite a large privately held bank. Those ratios has uh, about $3 billion in assets now. It is an extreme, they have about 1,000 employees. They... Um, they're, a one, they're one of the nation's leaders in HSA accounts. They, what they do, though, is they're not a retailer when it comes to HSA accounts. They work like they are with us. So we do all the work. We do all the customer service. They provide all the banking and the trust accounting and things like that. Wonderful, wonderful people. Those ratios at the bottom are meaningless. I should take them right off the presentation. But, you know, way back when, when all the banks were, we were all afraid of all the banks failing, there were ratios that they had to put out, uh, tier ratios and risk-based capital ratios that they had to put out to tell us uh, theoretically that your bank was about to collapse, right? Well, uh, that's just, those numbers are just outstanding numbers. And it was kind of weird because I talked to the chairman of the board of the bank uh, about two or three years ago and I asked them how they weathered the storm of the bubble and the collapse. And, and his first response was kind of a humorous, what bubble? So I didn't, you know, coming from California, if you live in California and you live in Florida, you live on the East Coast, you know, the housing collapse was massive. It was huge. I mean, we lost half our value of our house, okay? But in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota, they didn't have such a bubble. I mean, they had a bubble, but it was a, you know, $50,000 bubble, not a $400,000 bubble. So, it, the, the, you know, it went up a lot less, it went down a lot less. And, and so, really, a lot of the banks that were well-managed, that didn't reach into the high, fast-paced growth areas like California, you know, didn't have the same struggles as the banks that went headlong into uh, the, uh, the, the craziness. Okay, when you, to enroll, um, you're going to enroll online. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have to sign up for the HDHP plan first. We want to make sure that people don't incorrectly go online. And, and correct me, Denise, if I'm wrong as to how you want to do this. But, but uh, So you're going to go through your enrollment, and your enrollment is going to be, deadline is going to be May 30th. So after May 30th, the district is going to gather up all the enrollments, and then we're going to give you the online enrollment information to go and open your HSA in June. Right? I'm actually working with Karen on that. Okay. Because eligibility doesn't technically start until July 1 right. when the high deductible health plan kicks in. So we're working on some of those details. We'll certainly um, communicate those to everyone okay. who enrolls. Okay. So we'll, the, 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 all the, the, the dates that you actually go on and enroll will be, it'll be in June at some point. The plans will become effective on July 1 when, you, when your HDHP actually starts. And that way, the district can just control, make sure that people aren't going online when they're not eligible. Okay? Um, so just to make sure I'm covering all this. All right, so just kind of in summary, uh, I, I just, you know, a little, little humor at the top there. Um, so the HSAs are your money. Interest is paid on the first dollar. You have 24-7 access to your online web portal. You can ask for distributions online, and you'll be able to see how much is in my cash account, how much is in my investment account, so you'll have, you'll, you don't have to remember this stuff. It's all there right for you. Uh, you can pay service providers directly, but there's a $2.50 charge. You'll have your debit card, which is a Visa-based debit card. No extra charges are charged for investment for the investment portal. You don't pay tax, federal taxes on the money going in, on the money growing, or on the money coming out as long as you take it out for medical expenses. And they're, very, they're really very easy to manage. Questions? If we didn't answer them all already. I actually have two questions okay. for you. Um, I know the answer, but I want to hear your Oh, gosh, I hope <laughs> I know the answer. 
Um, can Los Rios contribute on my behalf if I'm not eligible to contribute? And then the other thing is, do I have to contribute if Los Rios is contributing? So uh, these are trick questions. Okay, so can Los Rios contribute if I'm not eligible? No, right? Los Rios is only making a contribution if, you're in, uh, if it's collectively bargained, right? If it's agreed to, A, and B, if you are eligible and have, and have opened an HSA. You have to open your HSA account. The district cannot do it for you. So if you sit around and wait till October, even if you're eligible for the employer contribution, it's not going to be made. And you can't go back in time because the district can only make it to accounts that are open. So if you're eligible and you're signing up for the HDHP, make sure you open your HSA by July 1. But they cannot make a contribution to an HSA account unless you are eligible and have an HSA account. What was the second question? Did I get that right, by the way? <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, the other thing is, can Los Rios be putting money in the account on my behalf and I can start and stop my contribution? Okay. So the other question is, and I don't, probably don't even need to repeat this, but the, the question is, is, if Los Rios is making a contribution to my HSA, am I required to also make a contribution? And the answer is no. There's no obligation. You can just open your HSA and enjoy the, the district contribution. There's no, uh, there is, there's no match. It's not a match. It's a direct employer contribution. Anything you do on your own is over and above what the district does, and it's completely voluntary. Okay? But I encourage you, if you're going to go this way, if you're going to go with the high deductible health plan, and it's a wonderful option. Uh, we've been in it. My family's been in now for a couple of years. Uh, we would never go back. But, we, we are very lucky. We were able to maximum fund our HSA. We were able to get all the risk of out-of-pocket exposure out of the way. We have a few dollars in the bank, so we understand not everybody does. And so we can cover our out-of-pocket expenses on our own. We actually have a much higher out-of-pocket exposure under our high deductible health plan than you do here. So, um, but now that we've you know, accumulated money and we're using it for the future and all that good stuff, it's an actually a phenomenally secure feeling to have. We've essentially got 100% of our medical exposure covered for the next few years, even if we don't put in a dime. So even if you have an old style plan, remember you're still gonna pay co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance and it's not gonna cover things. It's certainly not gonna cover all your dental expenses. It's not gonna cover all your you know, vision expenses and whatnot. So these accounts are really wonderful accounts. And once you get over the fear of that, that potential big hit, they're, they're really, there's really nothing else that really scares people. One other thing I wanna say about that, say the 3,600. So you open a family account and you have a $3,600 exposure. I cannot speak for hospitals, so you can't go to your hospital and tell them that this guy uh, told me I could do this, okay? But if you go to the hospital and incur a $3,600 expense, and let's say you've just opened your HSA, you don't really have any money in it, and the hospital sends the bill off to Western Health Advantage, and Western Health Advantage pays, and you get your EOB that says you owe $3,600, and then a week later you get a, a, a bill from the hospital. You know how it works? You go into the business office and say, I can't pay this all at once. Almost, I, I, and again, I cannot make guarantee, I can't speak for hospitals, but they will allow you to make payments, almost assuredly. So, you know, you, you just, you know, they, um, so don't panic when that happens. Rob? Okay? There's really, in my mind, there's nothing to be terribly afraid of. It's a great way to go. And traditional health plans, out-of-pocket expenses are just going to go up. The expense, the premiums are going to go up, and and the out-of-pocket co-payments and things like that are going to go up. So you and I are going to take over more burden of our health care, no matter what. It doesn't matter where you work, by the way. The district has fantastic health plans. Rob. Okay. So, Rob. in any event, yes. Follow-up question to that. So, unlike the FSA, then an expense against the HSA. If I incur an expense, so I'm in the hospital in the fall, I'm eligible to contribute to the HSA. Can I fund the HSA and then make those payments to the hospital over the next, let's say, year? So it's falling into the next calendar year. Does that still work? Yeah, so uh, well, that's a great question. I think there's really a couple questions going on there. I mean, number one, the, the question is, is let's say I have a $3,600, inc I incur a $3,600 expense from a hospital a month after I open up my, my HSA. I haven't really put anything into it, a few hundred bucks and whatnot. You could if you wanted to, and if you could afford it, 
you, some of you probably have already figured this out, you could transfer 3,600 bucks from your personal savings account, pay it out of your, pay the whole bill out of your HSA, and you're done. You can do that. Make sense? Make sense? Okay. So, so the other thing is, is that once you incur that $3,600 expense after you've opened your HSA, the entire $3,600 is eligible for reimbursement out of your HSA. It doesn't matter um, how you pay for it or when you pay for it or if you pay for it the next year. You can reimburse yourself and then make payments to the hospital. It's an, it, because it's not like taking a tax deduction on your individual taxes. When we take a tax deduction, it's based on what I paid I get a tax deduction on, right? With an HSA, you have access to the money. You are eligible to that money once you've incurred the expense. So very similar to an FSA, it's, the, it's not when you pay for something necessarily, it's when you incur it. Often they're, they're, they're the same, you know, but they don't have to be the same. Does that kind of make sense? So just like we were saying kind of earlier, I incur a $3,600 expense this year. I can pay it out of pocket and not even use my HSA. I can save that receipt for 10 years and then take a distribution. I paid it 10 years ago. Yes. Um, this is for Mary Petroli. Um, I have a question. Um, you were covering um, the online bill pay and the debit card. Um, can you go over um, what kind of fees are incurred while pa paying your your um, your fee your uh, bills online? I, I noticed that there was a two hundred or two dollar and fifty cent fee charged for the bill pay. Can you go over that a little bit? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. It be this, it's like it's coming down from on high. Uh, the, uh, but any, and it should be a female voice, right? Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so in any event, uh, so just to be clear on that $2.50 charge, that $2.50 charge only applies if you go on to the web portal, the CBA web portal, and go into your HSA account and say, CBA, I want, I want you to send a check to Dr. Smith for $100. It's a one-off charge. If you use automatic, but transferring money from your bank account to our account, uh, there's no charge for that. And there's no charge for using the uh, debit card. Thank you. Does that clarify it? Thank you very much, yes. You're welcome. I hope I pleased you. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other you questions? You are blessed. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well then thank you very much for coming and I hope you get a lot out of it. I, I, I obviously uh, love these accounts and we, we see so much satisfaction from people that use them once they get that security of the money in the account. So there's obviously the fear of the unknown with anything that's new, but really once you get used to these, I, 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 I can't guarantee it because every individual is different, but people really like these and they, they have no intention of giving them up. So hopefully you've uh, convinced you that there's nothing to be afraid of. Okay, take care.